Stories of the Week is brought to you by Anapsis, the leading provider of solutions to protect ERP systems from cyber attacks. Customers can secure their SAP and Oracle business critical platforms from espionage, sabotage, and financial fraud risks. Visit them on the web at anapsis.com. And by Pony Express. Check out the Community Edition and turn your Nexus 7 into a lean, mean, pen-testing machine. For all those hard-to-reach places, there's Pony Express. Visit them on the web at PonyExpress.com. And by Black Hills Information Security, the leaders in penetration testing and active defense. Email consulting at BlackHillsInfoSec.com to request a quote today. And now, the stories for this week. Jack, what do you got? We should talk about the Microsoft thing first. Right, Microsoft thing. Was it, did something happen with Microsoft this week? Did mic- the world end or something? Some SSL Microsoft thing. Can you tell us about that, Jack? <sighs> well, what the, the, the hell the, happened? The, the really short version is it was a really big uh, Patch Tuesday, and there was all sorts of stuff. Wait, I thought Patch Tuesday was next Tuesday. No, it was this week. It was this Tuesday. Yeah. Gotcha. Yep. And there was all sorts of stuff, including a big honk and IE roll up, as always, and... Uh, the one that sets me and other old goats on edge, which was yet another true type font vulnerability because they render fonts in the kernel. Because who thought that was a bad idea other than anybody with a clue? But then there's this other thing like MSO, MS14066 Apocalypse or something. Apocalypse. Uh, yeah, it's it's yet another apocalypse. It is the, the current end of the world. Um but I'm not going to try to d- dive into the, the technical details, but to, to grossly gloss over this, uh, SSL and TLS uh, things have been looked at more than they have been in a really long time, and a decades-old vulnerability has been found in uh, every supported and pretty much every unsupported version of Windows. And you should wow. just go patch it, because it's got man-in-the-middle and other potentials for getting at your uh, your clients, and it has uh, substantial issues for your server services. And rather than panicking or falling into the hype, you should just move this one, particularly uh, 14066, forward in your testing and deployment cycle. Get in, get over it. There we go. It's bad. Don't screw around with it. Test it. Deploy it. Deploy it in stages so you don't break things you're not surprised with, but there you go. One of the unpleasant things about this is that even if you have supported versions of uh, XP, Mm -hmm. uh, my understanding is, correct me if I'm wrong, folks, but my understanding is that there is no patch for whatever (laughs) that embedded version of XP is that is still supported because XP doesn't actually support anything modern because it's freaking old, people. Um... So even if you're supported on a supported version of XP, you're probably just dangling in the breeze to this. But thankfully, nothing critical runs on that. Nothing that has... Oh, never mind. Um, like so ca- cash registers, point of sale systems. ATMs, yeah. Things things, things that you manage yeah. via secure web interfaces. Oh, wait. Oh. That's all right. They uh, manage them via Telnet, so you don't have to worry about it. Um. Yeah, well so I mean, we could thing. we could scream a lot. I think everybody screamed a lot this week about it, right? But I, I, how about this? Just really push this one forward in your testing and deployment cycle. It's it's important. There, move on next. And don't trust SSL. How do you not? How do you get away from? You can't get away from using SSL. That uh, that I, I think is well, what it makes it the bug challenge. More the challenge is that we all um, say SSL when we mean TLS. Yeah. Right, and so what we want to be doing is running current versions of TLS, not running SSL. But we and everybody on the planet just can conflate the two. But yes, we want to be running TLS, current TLS, not SSL. Um, and that's all that addresses a series of, of issues. Uh, it doesn't solve all the problems. And then we want to patch our shit um, and not freak out about it. I mean, it's. Uh, <sighs> I have a hard time. Everything can't be a crisis, people. Really, it can't. It's serious. But it is a crisis, Jack. It, it's serious. Uh, and if this or 
poodle fart or whatever other vulnerability Wait, is out. Wait, why is it poodle fart? I don't know. It's not. It. I, just, I just, the whole thing gets, if it's any of these. Because it stinks. If any of these are worth you panicking over, you're probably already screwed. What, what good is panic? Uh, the only reason you would panic is because you don't have a way to really fix that easily in your environment. Right. I mean, it's apply mitigation. I, you think about what it is. Think about what's vulnerable. Figure out how to apply the patches. It, it's if it's unpatchable, if you're running XP, you know, if you've, I assume, I assume NT4 has got vulnerabilities. And if you're still running that, you're already screwed. Um, think about how you can mitigate those. Think about what you've got in front of your IIS4 box. Joff, as a penetration tester, do you see yourself um, adjusting some of your tactics and techniques to deal with this latest round of man-in-the-middle type TLS SSL attacks? Yeah, that's an interesting question. That's an interesting question, Paul. I I don't I don't think so because an awful lot of what we're doing these days, honestly, um, gets kicked off in the in the social engineering realm. Um, and uh, you know, would we um, with the reemergence of remote code execution over network sort of vulnerabilities? I guess it's possible. You certainly shouldn't ignore it. Um, but uh, it's it's still more difficult to find servers sitting out there um, that are that are you know wide open to these sorts of things. Um, now this one obviously, as Jack pointed out, is very um, critical. I mean, I think there was a ZDNet article here that said you know drop what you're doing and patch it. You know that that's no joke here. I mean this one's like uh, um, don't 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 miss out. <laughs> so, but it, it's interesting that you say that, Joff, and then also say that. You know, for pen testing, you know, mostly it's still client attacks. Yeah, I mean, it is. I mean, <laughs> let's face it, the weak, the weak link, honestly, it is the human, right? I mean, we've known this for, for quite some time. Um, but, cl you know, client applications and client application attacks have certainly <clears throat> kind of changed the face of the attack surface. And, and Elliot, to your research, uh, you know, you mentioned during your interview that honeypots kind of fell out of the spotlight for a while and largely I think because everyone kind of shifted to client pays the tax and that kind of made the honeypot kind of obsolete right yeah and it, it's interesting that we're coming full circle now and saying while well, client attacks are still very valid um, there's still tons of service services that are vulnerable to attacks and password brute forcing and remote buffer overflows so it's like we can never escape a trend is really, I feel like the situation we're in well, now, like just when we think we're safe of, well, you know, in 1999, like CGI based web applications, that was really bad, but that came full circle when everyone started using PHP and, and that's all yeah, like problem. That was yeah. A good idea. Yeah, people <laughs> figured out that you can exploit client side attacks. So a lot of the remote exploitation kind of went, not went by the wayside, but was a lesser concern from a threat perspective. But now we've seen these age-old vulnerabilities, and not this one with Microsoft, but, you know, the, the Bash vulnerability, for example. And then it's like, well, I guess remote attacks are kind of, kind of concerning, even though the vector was web on, on that one. But it, it's like I we're never safe. Right? Ways, Paul. I mean, you know, here's the thing, right? I mean, I think what, what you're seeing is we saw a trend away for a while because... We got good at patching things. We got good at protecting um, exposed surfaces from the server's perspective. But now I think the research community is is catching up again um, with a new and vigorous look, especially in the TLS area, right? TLS yeah. SSL library area, and finding things that um, are, um, you know, as we just pointed out, decades old vulnerabilities and code bases that. All of a sudden, that you know, just because you take a new approach, a new look at it, put a heavier microscope on there, if you like, um, things are coming up. So it, I think it waxes and wanes. It depends on the interest of the community at any particular point in time. <coughs> I agree. There's never a uh, never a dull moment as a penetration tester or a defender in the security realm. Things always seem to come around and come full circle. Which is kind of interesting. I think that the really tough part in the penetration testing world is um, 
how we can give the most comprehensive view. That's that's probably the big the biggest challenge that we have in, yeah, in the pen no, testing right. world. Yeah, because we we can get in via a client side attack, but then how well did we test some of the remote attacks? And then did we test man in the middle type attacks, which are more difficult to pull off, Joff, in a from an attacker's perspective, a target. I think the real difference here is with all the man in the middle attacks that are affecting SSL and TLS, whatever you want to call it, Jack. Right? We use those terms right. interchangeably. And you're right; there is a, there is a difference, but they're more th difficult to pull off in a targeted attack. And let's not use the term APT, please. But if you're I in a general sense looking to pwn a bunch of stuff. Uh, a man in the middle is an option that you're probably going to exercise in in those situations. In in Joff, in Elliot, right? Your roles as penetration testers, your attacks are very targeted, and so you're going towards the spear phishing and client side attacks. Um, and but when we look at what the underground is doing, right? The attackers that really their motivations are collecting, maybe not collecting intellectual property, but pwn as much stuff as you can man in the middle is a, is, a, is a more viable option for those folks because if your goal is to just own as many devices as possible or get people's random pass <coughs> passwords then man in the middle is a viable option yeah sure i mean sure it is it, it's um there's there's that age old um problem in the in, in the uh, or challenge in 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 the pen testing community in that um a real comprehensive attack takes time but everybody in, who's in the community, you know, we have business realities whereby mm -hmm. we have to execute um, a scope of work within a limited uh, right. time frame, and and so the the, um, the ability to be comprehensive uh, in your approach is is you know, ha frankly, hampered by the business reality. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, you, you can't know, see you know, how long work 24 hours a day, which some of us do. <laughs> yeah. Well, how long are you going to sit around and wait for someone to make a connection to some system that you happen to have a man in the middle attack against before your timer runs out to your point, Joff, you know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So so we tend to take um, you know, the sort of the path of least resistance and then yeah. try to um, get a little more comprehensive from there. And and that's a fair approach. I mean, let's face it, there is, no, it is. hubris in, yep. in any any criminal community. There's going to be some hubris as well. They're going to take that that path of least resistance. And um, yeah, like look at Elliot's okay. example. So, People just guessing uh, known usernames and passwords. Brute force guessing passwords. Yeah, sure. I mean, so it's got value still, but um, the the real um, value add is just to use a cliche is is. Once you get that path of least resistance, resistance, can you uh, uh, can you expand out a little and and develop um, some some real quality to your work um, to show different approaches? And and I yep. struggle with that every day. And I know a Absolutely. lot of absolutely. And that takes more time. I mean, you gain a foothold yep. maybe through a client side attack, but then how do you show that there's some kind of man in the middle vulnerability after that? Um, yeah, that takes time. You know. Well, and we all know that, that the common pattern with a lot of attacks is once you get that foothold, you go deep and wide from there, but there's usually not a lot of quote-unquote exploitation after that initial step. Um, and Yeah, uh, a lot of organizations will limit you once. They just want to know about that initial exploitation. And yeah. what you can do from there is kind of like bonus and either your timer runs out or your scope is limited or... The organization comes back and says, "That's enough." Yeah, that's right. Uh, and and you know, it's it's got value to demonstrate what sorts of things you can access. But at the same time, in terms of what we do, it uh, sometimes it seems like a little bit busy work, right? Because you've yeah. you've already you've already succeed, succeeded in breaking down whatever barriers you needed to break down to get your position on the inside of a network. So, you know, it's I think it's an interesting discussion. I I wish there were. You know, I think a lot of us wish that the business realities weren't um, in existence or, or, or had less of our existence. But you know, but they need um, that. They need that context, Joff. You know, what I find interesting, of course, in my line of work is when you, if you can discover all those vulnerabilities, and then you have to move towards prioritizing those and getting people to fix them, and then making sure that they're fixed. You, there's a couple of things. One, you get overwhelmed with the number of vulnerabilities you have to fix. 
And which ones do I fix first? Which ones take priority in my environment? Everyone's environment is different. And then let's say you prioritize a, a, a certain way. You have to then report that to management and say, well, you know, here's what we're fixing and kind of here's what's left. H- how do you show from an internal perspective to your management that we're making progress in some areas and these other areas we're not and getting the right resources to do that? Like, how do you prioritize vulnerabilities and then show management the progress in that whole vulnerability management process. I think that's a struggle that many of us have. It, it I- is. In IT. And, it, and it makes it hard for some of the things that like you and I have talked about and, and you know, in the, in the day job and other, mm-hmm. other context, uh, you try to convince people to find everything in their environment. And it's like, I can't fix everything. It's like, no, no, find, find everything. It. And then you get to be in control of prioritization. Yeah. And b- because I'm, I get to choose what I'm going to ignore. And if you find everything, any bit of context that you can add, you know, is this internet facing? Does it face the internet? Mm-hmm. You know, can, does the internet come to it? Can it go to the internet? You know, these are a couple of different important questions. Mm-hmm. And then if you have a well-instrumented network, you can get into the, the you know, the pivot scenarios. This this machine can't get to the internet, but this machine can get to the internet and get to this. And that's that takes a, a thorough knowledge of your environment. And you know, what do you? How do you do it? How do you prioritize these things? So you get down to yeah. Well, you get down to um, is are there exploits available somewhere? Is this being exploited in the wild? It gets down to. Uh, personal relationships it gets down to what information sharing should be about but often comes down to the, the to problem, word of mouth the you problem know. that i have I- in today's it world is the number of different technologies that we have at our disposal and how <laughs> that has greatly complicated what we do in terms of vulnerability management it, it, so i've been thinking kind of about this topic lately and so there are mobile devices there are cloud there are virtualization. Now, uh, granted, we, we, don't, we, don't forget the entire infrastructure that we all yeah want we've always to forget, had, right? Right. That yeah. we all always want to had. forget. I, all I don't the applications pick on, any, on the tens right, of I don't want to pick on any particular brand, but everybody's got those gray green boxes that switch packets in your network. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And even if you try to keep them up to date. Um, right, and it doesn't matter if it's that brand or anyone. But it's. But I, when I was the like last time you pushed firmware to your printers? Uh, no, never, because they die, and I have to buy a new one. Well, uh, the, <laughs> but the thing is, though, we've had these problems, and we've almost talked about them individually over time as they got when they were new, like when virtualization was new. Everyone's like, "Oh my God, the security ramifications are horrible." Then we got cloud. In cloud, you break out into two different areas. I've got my infrastructure in the cloud, and I've got my applications in the cloud. I mean, yeah, they're the same. It's all infrastructure in the cloud, right? But your workforce using Salesforce in the cloud is different from you deploying 200 servers in Amazon EC2, right? So those are almost two separate problems. They are two separate problems. Uh, They're... There are a lot of subtle. I mean, cloud is yeah. cloud is yeah. uh, but is, so is Russian nesting dolls. It depends on what layer you have access to. Yeah, but there's still more layers in yeah. between. But but then, you know, so we've talked about those. But now I feel like we've reached a point where that shit's just out of control. And so we well, let's throw in mobile, right? So here's my personal well, example I've been giving about mobile. I went to, I was at this point where I was, uh, I had Verizon for my data service. I had a MiFi Verizon hotspot. And I had AT&T for all of my cell phones. And I wanted to do some consolidation. I wanted to upgrade phones. I maybe wanted to add a tablet because our tablets are getting old. So I went to AT&T and I'm like, so what do you got? And I ended up buying, so just to go to show you how easily accessible this technology is, I bought a tablet for a dollar. It was an, it's an LG G+. Plus. It's an AT&T branded tablet. Now, granted, it wasn't for myself. It's for my family and my kids mostly. It has cellular data and Wi-Fi on it. I bought it for a buck, and it's $10 a month to add that to your data plan. I went into my son's Netflix account, and I dumped him down to standard definition because when he's watching TV at a restaurant, he doesn't know the difference, like whatever. He's watching cartoons anyway, so, you know, that doesn't matter. 
He's not watching it on a TV. He's watching it on a – it's a 7-inch tablet, right? Um, which is not that much bigger than my phone, which is kind of ironic. But um, So a dollar for the tablet, $10 a month to add it to my data plan. I would have paid easily – Eight to ten times that because my kids will be good when we go to dinner together, right? But that price point allows me to so easily add technology to my portfolio. Translate that now to the business that can add this technology, not just the mobile example that I gave personally, but this virtualization and cloud technology has come so far down in price. And the benefits are, are just awesome. I mean, my personal benefit, right, is you know, my kids can stay occupied. If you've got a a 19-month-old, right, you know the trials and tribulations of going out to dinner, right? It can be horrible. Um, so if I can get an hour uh, of dinner time, that's great. I have a 29-year-old, so... Uh, yeah, he probably <laughs> needs one, too. Um, <laughs> so but now translate that to a business, right? Every user is showing up with a laptop, a phone, a tablet, they want access to the latest and greatest uh, cloud-hosted right, application. Right. They do. And yeah. But there's a, in the enterprise, there's a different set of challenges, even in smaller enterprises, which is it's easy for you to downgrade the resolution on the kid's, la on the kid's tablet. But if you are responsible for vulnerability assessments mm -hmm. and your vulnerability management in our world, and uh, you want something to be fixed on the server clusters oh that's somebody else that you know that's a different fiefdom um, and it, you want firewalls updated because you've scanned them and they've got a problem or routers or switches mm -hmm. you know there's another fiefdom and then you want storage st right and so they're all the, the fiefdoms mm -hmm. and that's where I think it gets even more challenging is you have to apply your vulnerability management process to all those different fiefdoms. Right. And you've got to show them value mm -hmm. in cooperating with you and getting it done. And, the you know, that's a real challenge. And that's report all that to management. And, and get resources. I guess one of my points is, as IT security, we need a lot more resources at our disposal to keep up with all these other growing technologies. And I that's presented itself in these individual examples. But now take a step back and look at that as a whole. I think it was our VP of strategy really kind of made it very clear to me that all of these technologies are converging, right? You've got your, um, you've got your cloud application. You've got your embedded system in the Internet of Things, as we'll call it. And um, you've got your web application. And, and all those things are intertwined, right? Like my wife's scale or treadmill or whatever is an example. My Nest thermostat is a good example of that. It's an embedded device that sits on my wall. It's on my network. It runs Wi-Fi. So now there's wireless security coupled in that, as well as an embedded device, as well as a cloud application it's reporting up to, as well as a, a mobile app that I can put on any of my phones and tablets so that I can adjust the temperature in my house. And that model now is being applied to everything, and it's creeping into... All of the organizations which we set out to protect as and security professionals. And we still have those fiefdoms even though, you know, it's just switching. Yes. Well, it's switching that runs Linux. Yep. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's an embedded device that runs Linux. In the cloud, there the might be some Linux under the hypervisor. <laughs> and then mm -hmm. the web application yeah. probably is could be Linux or whatever. And what, the mobile yeah. app is running on Android, which is, yeah. And one of the frustrations is this is a convergence. The, the, the ability to... Um, use the tools that you've already got in place. It's like, hey, you know what? I have this thing that I use because I'm the packet monkey. Mm -hmm. But what I know about my packets is useful to the sim guys because they're doing... Yeah. All right, so I'm a packet monkey, NetFlow, right? NetFlow, look at what's happened with packets. I know what's going on. By itself, from the network perspective, that can be very informative. If I were to add the context that application people may have or your mail team may have, that could become a lot more valuable. But it's breaking down those fiefdoms, and I, I don't know. I don't know how to solve that. Because the real challenge to fiefdoms has nothing to do with technology. It's people. And we all know that, man, people are crazy. What wow. Did we, what did we just accomplish? I, I, don't, know. I don't know. I was.
just not a rant. Thing. <laughs> I wouldn't call that a rant. I would no, call no, that rambling. Just, yeah, you were rambling, rambling, but it it's um, it is interesting that it's all you know. It is as you said. There there is a convergence of all sorts of things, and we're not converging the management and even observation of yeah, the, the technology, converged environment. Yeah, the technologies are converging, but we are not in that, IT, in that's IT security. It. There you go. That's a great right point, there. Jack. That's a great <laughs> point. You just distilled that yeah. whole ramble. That whole rant. Basically, down you and I boiled it down to that. The technology is converging, Same. and we are not. And if we don't, we're more I'm screwed gonna than we I'm going to drop the are. microphone now because there is nothing more we're prolific that done. we could say. <laughs> To well, that I, point, I, bon appetit or cheers something. To that. <laughs> cheers to that. <laughs> I, I had a saying when I used to work in a larger enterprise environment, and, and it came down to this, um, especially larger organizations. We have reached a point where the technologies have exceeded our capacity as humans. Mm -hmm. Technologies exceeded our humanity because e these organizations cannot cope with this much diversity. I mean, that, that's what you're expressing. Yes. Um, and... You well know, there are job. some that are able to, by limiting the choices, right, by containing the diversity, and that's a very top-down kind of approach. I mean, banking environments come to mind. Um, but, you know, a tremendous amount of the other ones just cannot do that. And so they are, by nature, drowning. I mean, just it just is. And, and it, it, it's, it's a difficult thing for someone like myself to deal with who loves technology, and I want to adopt technology, but then the security aspect of me is like wow this is really freaking bad and that 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 can be a tough thing to deal with and, and i i don't like to promote the you know the it security school of no where you just say no you can't have this new technology you're, you're never going to win that you never were going to win that in the past and you're certainly not going to win that now because there this technology is enabling business uh in a huge way and when it comes down to That's it, right. it's you know it comes down to the bottom line um, for every organization. I mean, e even you look at the academic models, right? I mean, they're huge adopters of technology. They've got a, a really large audience to appeal to that is directly contributing to their bottom line. Look at their student and faculty population, right? I mean, that's that makes their bottom line. So. Um, you, who's to, to say from a security perspective, well, we shouldn't implement that technology because it's insecure when it contributes so much to the bottom line? Well, the, 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 um, the no approach um, in the more open environments, particularly uh, um, academic, it just flat doesn't work. I mean, it just, it's just not going to make it. And, and I would actually make the argument that this just say no approach, it doesn't actually work in any environment anymore. No. Because, you know, the, the consumerization of the technology is, is way beyond the capability of any corporate structure to try to contain. And, uh, and so um, a different sort of approach is needed, not, not a containment approach anymore. Um, and I'm not quite sure from the information security perspective how exactly we're, we're supposed to handle that except for get innovative and, and think of new models uh, in new ways. Um, I, I tell you what, I, 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 I hate to sound like a shield, but I, I like the DevOps kind of style approach of thinking, right? Is be really good at IT management and process management when you're rolling out this new technology. See, see what breaks and be able to roll out new stuff really, really fast. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I, think I like that, that idea. Y yeah, the execution. Very, the execution is very, very so difficult. Y y so some, you know, Joff, key enough what you've said, one of the more, um, I don't know, interesting, informative, discomforting conversations I've had in the past year or so uh, was at, um, besides Nashville, I was chatting with uh, Wynn Schwartow, and we were talking about the, the complexity of the systems we face. And he pointed out that, you know, years ago as a computer science student, you would be asked things like, tell me everything that happens on this computer system mm -hmm. in a 15-second window or a five-second window. And if you go back enough years, that was actually a viable uh, assignment. Sure, if you were possible. to, <laughs> If you were to ask that of somebody today, with a, I mean, we're not talking high-end systems, air quotes, not high-end systems. We take my new Ultrabook. 
It's just a little laptop. It's lightweight. It doesn't even have an optical drive, right? It's got two USB ports. There's nothing much to it. It does have a fourth gen i7, so it has that kernel, I mean, that uh, processor virtualization thing happening with whatever magic that is and whatever that TPM thing is. Which, and, uh, you know, there is 8 gigs of RAM in it, and it, it's the, the RAM is faster than processors were not that long ago, and it's a big SSD. And But, you know, I mean, still, how much can happen in five seconds? Well, um, more than we can actually enumerate. That's right. I just... Wait, no, that's it can't be that. Uh, uh, well, no, okay. All right, I got it. I got it. Okay, so Hyper-V is running, and it's running two virtual machines, which are in, – and then I'm using it. And tw uh. Look, we had an interesting conversation. Can I go back to fixing last, cars? Last week <laughs> um, with uh, – was it Ming last week? Yep. Uh, yes. And and he, he actually nailed this to some extent, and, and, and I have said the same thing before, and, and that is – the only hope, the only piece of optimism I think we have here um, is that we have to, absolutely, there is no choice. We have to convince the academic community and you know teaching and learning community that the software development lifecycle must have a security component because if it yeah. does not, and it is not taught that way, we will not win this battle. No, I, I, I was actually in the back of my mind wanted to mention that Jeff I'm glad you brought it up it's so so true and that was the kind of the I think one of the highlight you know highlights from that highlight reel with Ming was making sure we instill this security mindset in the people who are going to be developing the software that we'll all use five ten years from now that's yeah, the only it's, way it, it's the only way because otherwise the the battle exponentially gets worse you know month by month week by week um, because more and more software comes out, and that is released without a security development, be, uh, you know, in in the in the life cycle without security. Component. Is it kind of like and we need to mess, develop you know? a safer car, not stronger seatbelts, Jack? I know you like to draw those car analogies, and I have to admit, I've been watching one of my favorite shows lately. To diverge a little bit, has been the British version of Top Gear, the original Top Gear. I love that show. Oh, Chris is, is it, giving it is me the fist pump. so much better than the U.S. or Australian oh, I version. watched one episode of the U.S. one and never watched that again. The only version. Now, the, my only complaint about the, the British, British version is brilliant. I need to get some of my, my, my British friends to help me out with some of the things that they reference because I don't get all the references because they're, you know, they're from the U.K. I'm like, I don't. They talk. They make references and make jokes. And, and they it have, goes like right over my yeah, head. And, and, I have no and they have people about. on who are obvious giant celebrities yes, and exactly like, who the I'm hell's like, that who it is that i'm like it's I have a no british idea. actor that wasn't in harry potter what the hell right i mean <laughs> so I'm, I'm really i'm really sad they don't or talk. even downton abbey i mean so they're not even a b-grade british actor yeah. right oh, but the, oh. they don't talk a lot about mini coopers because i think it's that's it's a boring, german right it's a, well it's a boring subject to them because but so everybody got a mini when they were the old mini was like was British your first car yeah, right yeah and they weren't all Cooper S's believe me right yeah, they were yeah, yeah. they were all just Austin minis with the the one liter one one and and they all you know <laughs> and at some point BMW bought them right is that BMW bought the name I mean it was the, the car was long gone I gotcha um, and some you know and it's yeah they don't talk a lot about minis which and, and they do like to drop pianos on cars and I haven't quite figured that one out um they it's just an <laughs> I, I tell you I what, just, I, 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 you know, I look, I've got nothing against dropping pianos on cars either. No, it's really, really cool. It's, I, the and they do crazy. Did you see that? Speaking of minis, did you see the one where they shot the mini off the ski ramp? No. Oh, you got to find that one. You, I got to go watch that. You got to find that one. That's that's killer. Yeah. As long as we're completely tangent. I mean, can completely we get twitchy on to get this tangent farther off? Oh, it's way far off. I, I the dynamic between if the you three hosts. Seen, but the dynamic between the three hosts on Top Gear. Is just awesome. right. oh, and and they're right. The little one, whatever his name is, the cute one, um, is, <laughs> yeah, is an American. Uh, he just does. He won't admit it, right? Yeah, he's he likes his cowboy boots and his muscle cars. But and like the the yeah. jokes <laughs> and the <laughs> dynamic between them is just it, uh, yeah, it's just awesome. It's almost as good as this show. Almost, almost. almost. I, <laughs> I, I, 
I, I strive to to get there because I'm telling you the, it, the stuff they say on that show it is, is great. It is great, and they <laughs> the awesome. They have a live studio audience like in the background. You would think. Now look, these are people that spend millions trashing, you know, multi hundred thousand dollar tractors and trashing supercars. You would think they would buy some chairs for the audience. They have no chairs. They have no chairs. Stand no up. Chairs. But I mean, they're Brits, right? So they're used to queues, right? They think that's great. <laughs> Um, they've they've yet to experience customer service. Um, I mean, I I love visiting Britain. I love going to London. It's fantastic. There's a reason that you have not heard the phrase "legendary British customer service." That's all I'm saying. We we have <laughs> we have an office in the UK at Tenable. I we think do. And I need to rely on them. Those to guys give me some are background. fantastic. They are, As a matter of awesome. fact, she needs to wake up right now, doesn't she? Marine needs to wake Marine up. Marine right does now. need to yeah. wake up right now. So yeah, yeah um, wake up, Marine. We, yeah. It, it props to, to Gavin and Colin who do some stuff um, for the latest Nessus release. Um, so we need to hit those hit those folks up to give us some context for Top Gear. That's that's what I'm but saying. Yeah, that's right. Well, John Mack. Well, no, uh, John Mack would just mess with our heads. He would. Uh, yeah, he would tell us the wrong he information. He would <laughs> okay, <yeah>. completely <laughs> mess with our heads, <laughs> and we'd be making a song. We'd be saying if you, stuff. If, but it, I'm sure there's is there job yeah. openings in that o- in that office. I don't know currently. We do have an office I there, and we are hiring. I'm not sure now if we have openings. If, you do, if you're listening and you're, you're, in, I, and you're in that part of the world. Well, when, when you joined the company, there was not a U.K. office or there a was European not, no, office. There was no And European. when I joined, there were two, three people, three people that quickly escalated to six. And last count was, what, 34? Um, I am pretty sure there are a couple of openings. I don't know the, the details. Um, yeah. And it, it's a good crew, and they actually believe in customer service too. It's, it's absolutely they do. Um, but uh, yeah, so I don't know. So anyway, what we're gonna do. We're I, gonna I do love it. Top Gear. It's, that was really my point of the. Uh, what I just what else, to, like, what else do we have to talk about? I don't chill know. and watch something. Oh, it it, it oh, kind yeah. of it gives me more idea ideas for the the Stokey Geek show, right? Because they review cars, right? And they have their opinions <laughs> on cars. We have our opinions on cigars. On this show, yeah, I mean, we have our opinions. We certainly, right. we have no, our we opinions. don't have opinions on this show. We have opinions, <laughs> right? But they're not they're not so like product focused. I mean, we we'll right, talk about right. products, but they're not so much. So, so you need the stick product. for cigars. We, yeah, we need the baseline, stick. everything. The stick. You need the the cigar stick. Um, oh, they reviewed the Nissan Cube, and they completely <laughs> trashed it. It was as hilarious. Well as well they should. As well they as well they should. Awful, but, uh, awful, it's horrible looking. Vehicle. It's, it's, I'm not even calling it a car. It's a vehicle. It, it's yeah. It's horrible. Yeah, it's it's, it's crazy. Like and the they, they do some of the Is dumbest the stuff on the planet. I it, mean, it just yeah. So so anyway, what else? Uh, I don't know. Uh, d- news, new news. I don't know if anybody's heard this. Oh, was this allegedly, the new, was this the news segment? Yeah, <laughs> allegedly, <laughs> and I put allegedly. <laughs> The Chinese are attacking the U.S. government and have hit the post office and the National Weather Service and or NOAA, National Weather Service. And um, and, and home, nobody's home really Depot talking again? about Home Depot again. Is uh, that still or something. Nobody's talking about motives. Nobody's talking about the accuracy of attribution. Although I heard recently on another podcast that attribution is easy and accurate, and um, I was alone. Thankfully, when I heard that, because there are no false flags. There is nobody that has taken advantage of standardized indicators of compromise and traces of uh, known groups to hide behind that. Forget it. Um, just one interesting thing about the National Weather Service attacks, two interesting things. One, allegedly, uh, they did not report as required uh, as a federal agency. But the one that really got me there is I, I just don't understand the attribution and the motives there, except in an actual kinetic conflict screwing with forecasts kills people as someone who has a couple of times done some blue water sailing in in boats from 42 to 110 feet um, you know when you get offshore as a matter of fact you don't even have to get that far offshore for the marine forecast to make a difference between a good day a bad day and your last day Uh, and so screwing with the ability to communicate with radar and things like that uh, that's not good. It it put a burden on commercial airlines who had to have their meteorologists fill in details that normally were missing. I, I don't understand that as a nation state attack, as alleged. I see that more as 
um, somebody screwed up. Now it could have been, it could have been uh, a, a nation state. Um, the Chinese, it just the whole blame everything on the Chinese thing. I'm not saying that the Chinese do not do Deserve espionage. Blame. Yeah, uh, but I- if it's if it's financial, we're going to blame the Russians, uh, and if it's non-financial, we're going to blame the Chinese. Seems to be a default position, and. You know, there's some reason for that, but uh, these I, I'm kind of worried about. Um, and it, uh, I don't know. I don't know. And I, it really concerns me when you screw with forecasts because, like I said, um, that's like dead people and stuff. That's not good. Um, oh, speaking of dead people and voting, because that happens apparently. Uh, there's a Oh, that's right. We are in Rhode Island. Yes. There's uh. a link to modifying an off-the-shelf wireless router for PDF ballot tampering. Um Chris uh, linked us to this article. Uh, I find it interesting. We haven't talked about electronic voting in a while. That was kind of a hot topic several years ago. Um, I will relate it to another TV show that I'm watching. Have you watched Scandal, Jack? You got to check out Scandal. It, 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 it's amazing that it appeals to a wide audience in that there's this like twisted, uh, multiple twisted love stories which will appeal to your significant other. Um, there are, uh, it's kind of like the spy angle, like CIA black ops angle. And there's quite a bit of hacking kind of angle. And although of course, like every other TV show, for the most part, it's, uh, not very well executed. Um, you know, hacking into the FBI takes, you know, 30 seconds on screen at best. Um, however, there's, there's a voting hack in that. Uh, that has to do with uh, compact flashcards and whatnot. So, um, th- this artic- this paper rather, is very interesting in that respect. The um, hmm, hmm, hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Th- there's a reason that uh, pull it back to. Where are you th- going with this, Jack? I, I'm going for a trip. So before I go there. You're going to B-Sides Delaware. I'm going to B-Sides. You're Delaware. leaving right from here to B-Sides I'm, Delaware. I'm leaving from here. Um, so before I go to that one, let's talk about a couple of my stories, uh, just of historical interest. My story number seven, which is actually two. Um, since I've been digging into this sort of thing, um, believe it or not, there is, for the <laughs> for those that missed the good old days or missed the good old days, and good old days is in air quotes there, uh, up on SourceForge now, there's a project that uh, has a simulator for the Multics DPS 8M mainframe, if you want to see uh, where we came from. And there's also an interesting story on remembering the women who did uh, code breaking uh, for the UK during the war. That would be World War II. Um, so there's uh, some interesting historical things cooking there. Um, and then what I was going to say about the, the voting stuff, and I... Bear with me while I fumble and stall to make sure I don't get it wrong. I, I got to tell you, that's hardcore to recreate Multics. <laughs> yes, that's um, that's not for the faint of heart. I mean, it, it just is nope. not. Um, I, I never touched one. I'm not that old. <laughs> Poke, poke. <laughs> uh, nor am I, because that actually uh, predates me. I was a mechanic. I wasn't even. So Ron Rivest uh, it created a, a voting protocol called the three-ballot voting system. And it's end-to-end auditable. And it, um, it is based on what he's learned in cryptography, but Rivest created this thing to be implemented or can be implemented on paper because Ron Rivest the R and RSA, and many other crypto things. Um, the R of RC, all of those things, uh, several MDs. Uh, Ron Rivest said, democracy is way too important to leave to cryptography. So he created a, a three-ballot voting system, which can be ex- implemented in paper. And basically, you, cr- you vote three times. Two of the ballots cancel each other out. The third one, therefore, becomes your real ballot. But by doing this, you're creating an obfuscation and trackable level of, uh, of voting. And this is somebody that knows something about securing communications over the Internet, and he came up with a paper ballot system. 
So uh, it is interesting that there's that much of a simple attack. But now, now we're getting back to the uh, bad old days of um, that uh, Ohio-based company and their uh, e-voting systems, which you can still buy on the Internet and people still use, even though they're garbage. What else? Are we done? Have we wandered? No, Joff, you have to talk to us about a reroute of Russian traffic. Please oh, do. right, right, right. This was really more about um, talking about BGP, which people forget about uh, in, in, you know, in the good old days. Uh, in my life, I, I spent a lot of time in, as a... A, a lobotomy, network. a quart of vodka, and a handgun, and I, you couldn't forget about BGP, but still. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But uh, it's amazing. If you actually sit down and do some trace routes once in a while, even, even from your home ISP, where your traffic will go... <laughs> And I think it was it was interesting. Maybe they're using uh, Apple Maps. Uh, yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, so I'm not even going to talk about the actual story. What people forget about is that um, that, that routing in the internet is is um, a, a unidirectional entity, and that route prefixes are advertised global wide into the border gateway protocol into the into the global internet table. And they can be hijacked at any moment and are frequently um, hijacked by longer prefixes. And every, everything, everything in the BGP table is all no, about... No, 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 people filter that out. I mean, because what was it, 15, they, they 18, do. They 15 do. 18 years ago, I mean, the, the loft got in the green van and, and drove to D.C. and testified and explained that this was a problem. And nobody it would did. ignore a fundamental problem in information security for was the decades. Was the van green? I believe it was a green van. It was a van. It was a van, <laughs> and it had antennas on it, and it right, took a so, detour. I mean, so, so the better providers out there, okay, let's let's just admit right now that you know there is a massive difference between various uh, tiers of of network providers in in the world, right? The better providers have got very good uh, security on their on their BGP peering. They're they're doing appropriate authentication with with MD5 or or greater with their peers. They're filtering prefix with prefixes uh, in terms of length accepted into their route table. They're doing AS path length uh, filtering. They're doing all yep. sorts of great things to mitigate these sorts of things. But that is not true universally across right. the planet it, and the it, Internet. It, and the, uh, the important thing there is that when you do that trace route, the dumbest, laziest, and most insecure hop on that trace route is the one that decides whether or not you're going where you belong. Exactly. And so that's, you know, it, it, it's an interesting turn of events for countries to, sc- to start thinking about and get upset with their, their traffic leaving their borders because the fact of the matter is this is a, a global internetwork and traffic leaves borders all the time. Uh, and I think there's going to be sort of a, a, a political realization there over time. And it'll be interesting to see where that develops um, because uh, <laughs> I'm you know, it, it started in the cloud world, right? Everybody got sort of upset about where things are being stored in the cloud world when they haven't really thought about how things are being transported. So uh, that's going to get uh, a little more interesting over time, I think, from a political, geopolitical standpoint. But well, that goes into the balkanization of the Internet um, idea that's becoming more and more real. It's not just China. I mean, the, the balkanization of the Internet, people... Exerting control over DNS, which starts to exert control over the entire thing, and then uh, what you do or don't do with your BGP, uh, we start to put some walls up in that um, global inner network, and whether or not there are always routes around it, we don't know. But yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. Um, If you have a multiple homed ISP environment, which a lot of these big ISPs are, you know, I don't want to undersell this. It is incredibly complex to maintain all these peering relationships and, and ensure that the appropriate filtering is done. These guys are doing heroic jobs in, in the well-run ISPs. So then the point of that is that uh, mistakes can happen and do happen. I, I, but not only that, there is intention <laughs> to some of these. Right, right. There, there, there's well. some intention to that. I, I um let me just say, I think that there are some people, some individuals doing heroic things in badly run ISPs, too, just trying to, to pull stay things alive. to <laughs> stay alive, right? Because n- none of us have ever been in an environment where we were totally screwed and just did the best we can and accepted how bad it was. Um, it's just the consequences are different when you're talking about running one a single server exchange instance 
or running BGP for a, you know a mid tier ISP. Um, yeah, exactly. One of the most terrifying things I've ever heard uh, was at Interop a few years ago, where I was chatting with somebody who said uh, he was he was really interested in security, but he he just didn't have any time for it, and he uh, you know he didn't work in security. And I asked what he did, and he was responsible for managing BGP routing for sort of a mid tier ISP, but he didn't do so anything did with security. Well, yeah, he did. I mean, he just did routing, not. Mm. And st- but but you know, he was trying to get the packets to flow. He was trying to get the packets where they belonged, and he was doing everything he could. And um, yeah, yeah. Uh, what else? What else? I don't know. We got a bunch of stories. There. I um, I think we should wrap up. I think we should wrap up. I okay, let's. Ta- you know what? Let's I take a break. Let's take a short break. Come back and wrap up uh, this episode three hundred and ninety-five. Did I get that right? Three hundred and ninety-five. Thanks, everyone, for listening to this edition of Paul's Security Weekly. Thanks to Joff and Jack and Elliot for uh, helping out with this episode. It's been a lot of fun. Don't forget to check out episode 400 on December 19th. Mark it on your calendars, baby. We're going to do an all-day podcast on December 19th. Don't forget to email psw at securityweekly.com if you want to participate in episode 400. We'd love to hear from you. We got a, a lot of content to fill, so now's your chance. We're going to fill up uh, some uh, uh, panel segments. We're going to do some individual interviews. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to be, I don't know how we're going to drink cocktails all day. Uh, I think we might have to have a 12 o'clock start on the cocktails. Eh? I, I, I think we need, well. Because we've never tapped that keg at 8 we in have, the morning. We've, we've, yes. We have <laughs> tapped a keg at 8 in the morning. But beer is much more low alcohol than We'll, we'll ease into it with a proper uh, uh, Irish coffee. I think Elliot's... Su- I like Elliot's suggestion of uh, Bloody Mary. We we can certainly start with some... I think some we start with Bloody Mary. And we can... St- you know what? I, I've, I've been told this. I've never actually tried it myself. It is possible to make cocktails with a reduced amount of alcohol. I don't believe you're capable of doing that, Jack. I don't think I'm capable, I, I but I've heard I, it's is, possible. What is that he is it's, talking that's, of? That's, it's going to be Christmas time. There's going to be cocktails. Father Christmas will there's be behind the bar. There's so going to be Security Weekly all day. <laughs> I mean, you you have to tune in on December 19th, no matter it's what you're doing at work. <laughs> it's right before the holiday break, so you can totally if, blow if off work. If you're in the neighborhood... Swing by, yeah, definitely. You if definitely you're anywhere absolutely. near Rhode hey. Island, we've got plenty of seats... Uh, which we don't have a camera on. Father Christmas will have plenty of lap. Uh, we'll have plenty of seats, plenty of laps, plenty of drinks, <laughs> plenty of food. Come to the studio. It's going to be an all-day party in support of the EFF on December 19th. So with that, thanks, everyone, for watching. Jack, take us out. Over and out of alcohol. All right. Hey, don't forget, fans, I'll be there on the 19th as well, in studio, in person. Joff will be here. Yay. I'll have to get you drunk again. Again. It could happen. (laughs)